My name is Tommy Alderman. My lovely wife Patty over here driving the, driving the camera for me. We're from Alderman Farms in Brookhaven, Mississippi. And I want to talk to you a little bit this morning about when trauma strikes, how to survive the aftermath of a traumatic event. Um, some of you may or may not know of us. We're on YouTube and Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and Pinterest, although we don't we don't pin much stuff. But um, in my former life, I spent almost 20 years in law enforcement. Uh, the last several in my in Lincoln County, Mississippi, but the majority of it in our hometown of Baker, Louisiana. Uh, where I was officer alderman and then sergeant alderman. Um, and I was an Oreo in that part of an Oreo in that picture. Uh, but I was also a charter member of the state of Louisiana's uh, critical incident stress debriefing team. And we were trained to respond when uh, law enforcement officers anywhere in the state were involved in some type of traumatic event. Uh, officer involved shooting, you, you name it, uh, to help them to go in and process what had taken place and to help them to think through what, or to know what to expect mainly uh, out of their bodies, out of their minds, or whatnot, because uh, the brain is a funny thing. And our main message was to help them understand that basically whatever they experience, they're normal, they're not crazy. Um, and so in December of 2016, my 140 pound Anatolian shepherd dog named Duke uh, tried to kill me. I love that dog, and believe it or not, he loved me. And 99.9% .9 of the time, he was a giant, harmless, lovable fuzzball. Um, we had, I've got lots of wonderful memories with that dog, and one very, very bad memory. Um, I won't go into the, the details of what happened that day. This is so funny. That's him as a puppy. It's really not funny, I guess. And I made that little meme and posted it all over social media, and I didn't know that I was being prophetic. Um, but the details of what happened to me that day and uh, the, of how I survived the actual incident and how my ni then 19-year-old son saved my life by shooting the dog while he was still on me and shooting a hole through my britches leg. You can find it at allinyourfarms.net slash blog. That's all you need to know because it's the last blog I put up. <laughs> it posts the most recent one and that's the most recent one. I don't, I don't blog like I should, I suppose. Um, I do want to show you just so you kind of understand that this was a critical incident for me. The following slide is, contains four images of my face following treatment that night in the hospital. So I've got this warning right here. If you don't want to see that, shield your eyes and then I'll tell you when you can stop. So I've given you fair warning. Now I'm going to click it and show you what the images look like. Kind of hard to see from that distance, but I was airlifted, had to be airlifted to the hospital. Uh, that cost more than five dollars. It cost more than the helicopter rides in Gatlinburg, Tennessee, I can tell you that. And uh, I spent six and a half hours in an emergency room with two men stitching up my face. Or, or four hours of that was two men stitching up my face. The right side of my nose was hanging down here on top of my upper lip. They put it back together. I did not have plastic surgery or anything. I was hoping that they, I was hoping that I would come out of it looking like Tom Selleck, but it didn't. You know, I didn't even get Bruce Willis out of it. You know, but uh, I survived. I have no complaints. The right side of my upper lip is still mostly dead. For you Princess Bride fans, um, I can't feel very much here, but. I don't care. God is good, and because I was seconds away from death or blindness or total disfigurement, worse than this. And uh, so I'm, I'm a very blessed man. And Lord, for you having to sit through that slide, I present this. <laughs> um, it was a bad deal. And <clears throat> immediately, the principles that I had learned 
in critical incident debriefing helped my family and I. I didn't suffer any traumatic events in law during my law enforcement career. Uh, so I didn't really need to apply the principles, but boy did they come in handy uh, following this event. And it and it dawned on me, oh there's a picture of the, the bullet hole in my pants leg. It went through, uh, I guess my pants were folded. We actually found the bullet still had denim fibers in it. We found all three rounds and that one had denim fibers in it. But it dawned on me that there was a plethora of, I just love the word plethora, and I, I use it every chance I get. But there's a plethora of information out there available for law enforcement and military uh, that are very familiar with these principles. Um, but nobody ever talks to the average citizen about these things. The other thing going on me is that trauma can happen to anybody, anywhere, at any time. And so we're going to talk through a couple of definitions here, and then I'm going to teach you what to expect should you be involved in trauma. If any of you have ever suffered a traumatic event in your life, this is going to help you. Last year at this conference, I made this presentation, and about an hour after we were through, a young mother came up to me with tears in her eyes and wanted to talk to me. And I, I, won't, I don't have permission to share what happened to her so many years ago. She lost her husband, but I don't have permission to tell you all the details. But I want to tell you the bottom line is this happened years ago, and she overheard somebody. They weren't trying to be mean, but they overheard, she overheard somebody saying, you know, she's not really reacting like I would expect a young woman to react. She just lost her husband. And for years, she carried the burden that there was something wrong with her, that she was not the wife that she should have been, until she heard some gray-haired, loud-mouth dude from Mississippi come up here and say, you're normal. And she just wept, and she was set free from just the simple information that you're going to hear today. So my prayer is, somebody that, I hope nobody's carrying a burden, but if you are, I, I hope that today's the day that you get to lay it down and realize there's nothing wrong with you. So first, let's, let's look at the, the difference between cumulative stress and what I call, we call, critical incident stress. Cumulative stress is stress that builds up or accumulates over time. The stress of everyday life. It can be work-related, relationship issues, frustrating situations, made worse by lack of exercise, poor eating habits, poor sleep habits, major life changes, new job, moving, it's important to note here that not all those things on there are bad things. You could get a job promotion, a great new job, a great new house, but it, it does contribute stress to your life. So it doesn't have to be negative. Hand, uh, tips for handling that type of stress <coughs> is regular exercise, regular honest communication with your spouse, your parents, your peers, healthy eating, plenty of water, healthy amounts of sleep and rest. So what is a critical incident? Also in more recent days referred to as a high stress event. Very important definition here. A critical incident can be defined as any event that has a stressful impact sufficient enough to overwhelm the usually effective coping skills of an individual or group. Critical incidents are abrupt, powerful events that fall outside the range of ordinary human experiences. These events can have a strong emotional impact even on the most experienced among us. Looks like part of the bottom of the slide is cut off, but I see some of you taking pictures of the screen. Feel free to do that. I'm going to give you a link at the end where you can go get a free PDF from our website that has all of this important information in it. Um, There we go. Oh, sorry. It's very important. Failure to effectively deal with cumulative stress will worsen the effects of a critical incident stress. So if you if you have tons of cumulative stress and you don't take care of yourself, you're not sleeping well, you're not eating right, you're not drinking plenty of fluids, you don't exercise, and then suddenly you're facing some high stress event, it's going to be worse on you 
on your body and on your mind and so forth. So take care of yourself. Deal with that cumulative stress. <coughs> Let me go back right just for a second. I want to point something out. I want to point out a very important word in the definition. And the, 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 the important word is any. In the second line there, critical incident can be defined as any event that has a stressful impact. It doesn't have to be some big, huge, major thing. Um, and it's also very important for you as an observer not to judge other people who may come crashing down over something that seems insignificant to you. For example, there's a police officer that I know of who committed suicide after he witnessed a Pomeranian dog run out into the street and get run over and killed. And on the face of it, that seems like a silly thing to kill yourself over, right? There's no good reason to kill yourself. But the rest of the story is that he had lost a toddler in traffic. His own child was killed years before running into the street after a Pomeranian. And so when he happened to witness that, it just overwhelmed him. It, it, you know, it just all came rushing back. So any event, no matter how it may seem insignificant to you, we have blackness. We are in the. We have entered the void. There it is. All right. I'm not going to talk about all this fancy stuff. Um, but I, I have these pictures of the brain here. To set the stage for what we are going to talk about. This is not mumbo jumbo. This is not fantasy. Your brain behaves differently under stress and high stress. Okay? So there are things that could or may or may not happen to your body, your mind, or whatever, following a uh, critical incident that you have no control over because it's just the way chemicals and electricity are doing different things in your, in, in your body, okay? I just have those to make me look important and smart. <laughs> um, for example, high stress event amnesia. During a high stress event, the brain changes the way it records events. It just, it just reroutes stuff. Seemingly important facts are totally left out because the brain perceives them to be unimportant to survival. All that matters to the brain is staying alive. That's involuntary. Um, it, just, it just happens. Here's another thing that just happens or can happen. Confabulation. The disturbance of memory defined as the production of fabricated, distorted, or misinterpreted memories about oneself or the world without conscious intention to deceive. Accounts given immediately following a critical incident might very well differ from accounts that are given after some time has passed. And that doesn't mean that people are necessarily trying to be deceptive. Now, now I'm going to pause here to give you a public service announcement on behalf of my law enforcement brethren. Um, never believe initial reports that you see on the news that come out within the first 10 or 12 or 24 hours of something bad happening. They are notoriously unreliable. Not because necessarily, I'm not trying to say nobody ever lies, but not necessarily because somebody is intentionally trying to be deceptive. It's more than likely due to the involuntary confabulation that takes place in the brain. There was an officer involved in a shootout in a pharmacy. Um, and the officer had, it was a protracted thing, they didn't know where the guy was. And he made his way, y'all know what a, an old time pharmacy looked like where, where, where the pharmacy was kind of elevated and they've got like the, the a desk running the, or whatever, the bar and it's solid and they, and they walk behind that and then there's glass behind them where they keep all the good stuff, right? So this officer is uh, trying to clear the area and he finds himself up on that platform and he's walking along and suddenly he sees the bad guy out in the store and before he can turn to address him the guy raises his weapon fires shots at him but he was able to duck down beneath behind that thing for cover and he heard the glass break on the big window and felt the glass hit him on the back except it didn't happen 
Except it didn't happen. The guy did, he, the bad guy did raise his weapon at him, but he never pulled the trigger. He didn't hear the glass break. Well, he did, but there was no bullet. But his brain did that to him, and, and, and he was flabbergasted coming to find out that none of that happened. It, it really took him a long time to, to understand there was nothing wrong with him. It was just, it was just his brain behaving differently under stress. So don't judge people who give one account immediately following and later say, you know, because that happened to me. We pieced together things, uh, parts of the story of my dog attack for months. You know, and I, as things became more clear or we understood each other's perspective as those of us that were involved. Examples of critical incidents, also referred to as high stress events. And again, it can be anything. Serious accidents, machinery, automobile, Animal attacks, hello. <laughs> Criminal assaults, burglary. Yeah, I've ever heard people say they feel like they've been violated if somebody burglarizes their house. Could be a critical incident. Uh, sudden death of a loved one, especially if they die in your presence. Natural disaster. If you think of people in Panama City and the, and, and the coast of Florida have just experienced a critical event, a critical incident, you better believe it. They've suffered trauma. And they're, they're, if nobody helps him through it, there are going to be people who suffer a long time after going through something like that. Anything else that meets our definition of a critical incident, which is any event that has a stressful impact sufficient enough to overwhelm the usually effective coping skills of an individual or group. Abrupt, powerful event to fall outside the range of normal, ordinary human experiences. People react differently. One third people report experiencing little or no trauma. Little or, or, or no, we're going to go through some symptoms here in a few minutes. And approximately one third of people who experience a traumatic event report experiencing none of them. About one third experience moderate trauma. And about one third experience severe trauma. Any of the three is normal. Any of the three is normal. Why do they react differently? Well, personal coping styles. Some people may better equipped to cope than others. Prior exposure to high stress events. If you've been through a ton of critical incidents, the next one you know, may be worse for you, so forth and so on. Conversely, if you've been through several and you, you, you process them properly, the next one may be easier for you. You just never know. The degree of intensity of loss, additional learned information after, Things like this class are going to help the next trauma you go through be going to help you handle it better than if you didn't know what you're about to know. The balance of life. If you don't have what that means is if you have, you know, depending on how much cumulative stress you have in your life. So mitigating critical incident stress, training, pre-crisis preparation and education. That's what's happening right now. That's what you're in here experiencing right now. And then there's diffusing that needs to take place within hours following an event, which basically is a reminder of the things that uh, you've learned right here. A debriefing within days of an event could be necessary. We can talk more about that, but we're kind of running behind, so I'm going to keep going. Uh, one on one crisis intervention if necessary, family crisis intervention if necessary, follow up and referral if necessary. You notice that the last four of those a lot of times aren't necessary if the first two have taken place. Training is key. Knowledge is power. Knowing what to expect can go a long way toward mitigating the effects of critical incident stress. I'm going to illustrate this by talking about the power of the battle dump. Military uh, TAC units and law enforcement TAC units who, who serve high-risk warrants and whatnot know because they're trained that in the midst of a very high-stress event, things can happen to your body, such as your bowels may involuntarily release in the middle of a high-stress event. So such tactical units make sure before they embark, before they go out to serve a high-risk warrant, for example, or whatever, they take what they call colloquially a battle dump. They'll go to the restroom, sometimes even taking laxatives, to clear their bowels. 
because they don't want the added burden of being out there in the heat of battle. Uh-oh. And then battles release. So I want you to imagine a scenario right quickly. We've got two officers. One of them is a veteran. He knows all this, but for some reason he forgot to go to the bathroom or didn't have time, got there late, whatever. On the other hand, you've got a rookie who missed this day of training, doesn't know about it, that his bowels may release, so therefore doesn't go to the bathroom. They go out into a high stress uh, uh, exercise, and sure enough, both of their bowels release. Well, the veteran's response, the guy who knew about that, he's liable to re respond by, oh, <laughs> sorry guys, you know, don't get too close, kind of thing. But I want you to think for a minute about how the rookie may respond. He's not going to say a word. He's going to hope nobody smells. And the question he's going to begin asking himself is this. What's wrong with me? Why? Because he, he's going to think he's the only person in the universe whose bowels would do that. And he's going to begin questioning whether he's cut out for the job and continually asking himself what's wrong with me. You see, that there, what's the difference between the two? Simply knowing, simply knowing. An example from my personal experience following the dog attack, I had to sit up, I had to sleep in my lounge chair for seven days to keep my head elevated. And on about the third day, in the middle of the day, I was not thinking about the attack. You gotta understand this came from nowhere, connected to nothing. There was no thought that precipitated this. And I was suddenly overwhelmed with absolute abject terror. Uh, irrational, not connected to anything, and I'm balled up in my chair, just quivering, just oh, tensed up trying to get through it. I don't know if it lasted 30 seconds or three minutes or whatever, but you know, and then it finally broke. And my response was literally, huh, you know, there, there that is, you know, and I, and I went and found Patty and told her what had happened or whatever, because I knew. But what if I didn't know? What if I didn't know that things like that could happen? I would be asking myself the same question that the rookie who, whose bowels were released on unexpectedly on him, what's wrong with me? Why am I so weak? Things like that. But because I knew, I did. Knowledge is power. So you're getting some power today. Remember this? Everybody reacts differently. Never judge another's reaction by how you think you might react. Also remember these two things. If you don't remember anything else, I want you to remember three things. Number one, everybody reacts differently. And these two things. Any reaction, including no reaction, is a normal reaction. <laughs> remember? Everybody in here is going to be in one of those three groups. No symptoms, moderate symptoms, severe symptoms. Whichever one you fall in, you're normal. Any reaction included, no reaction is a normal reaction. And also, you are a normal person having a normal reaction to an abnormal event. It's the event that's abnormal, not you. Common reactions to critical incident stress. I'm sorry this is so small, but again, you're going to get a website at the end, you can go get the PDF that lists all this. Um, uh, I'm not, so I don't have time to really go over every one of them. I'll just admit, the ones that I've got bolded on the screen are the ones that I experienced following the dog attack. I did have nightmares. I did have a difficult time concentrating. And I did have intrusive images. That dog's face with his mouth wide open would just be right there. I mean, he'd drive down the road and do this, you know, because it just was like right there. Um, all perfectly normal. Not very pleasant, but normal. Emotional reactions. Fear. Feeling of failure. Second guessing yourself. Survivor guilt. Just a, a, a moment about that. You know, survivor guilt is a very real thing. Police officers suffer that a lot when there's a team of officers on the scene and um, one or two, one goes down or she goes down, the others question, why, why did it have to be him? Why wasn't it me? And that's a huge burden. It's a huge burden. It's normal. It's nasty, but it's normal. Mark or Cain, what does that mean? Everybody's looking at me. So I felt that. When I first went out to Walmart, first ventured out, I mean, I was just like, I just felt like everybody was looking at me. And uh, they weren't. They weren't. Uh, apprehension, 
Behavioral reactions. Never relax, changes, speech patterns, eating changes. And it's important that when, you know, anything you see up here that talks about changes, like eating changes, that could mean suddenly you can't eat or you don't want to eat. It could also mean suddenly all you want to do is eat. It could mean you never ate chocolate. Now all of a sudden you just want to eat a five pound bag of Hershey's Kisses every 10 minutes. Changes, any, any change in any direction is what this is talking about. Inability to rest or sleep, I have that. Um, in fact, I'm not ashamed to say this because it's normal. Uh, I like to sleep in pitch blackness. But the first night I went to the bed after you know, the end of the first the week in my lounge chair, I couldn't go to sleep in the dark. And I asked Patty, is it okay if we turn the bathroom light on? She said, sure. I slept with the bathroom light on for a week, two, two weeks or so. And then finally I felt like I could turn the light out and I could and it was fine. You know, but in the dark I just I just felt afraid, you know, and uh, but it didn't bother me. It didn't make me feel like less of a man. You know, it just was part of it. And uh, I knew it would eventually go away. If these things don't eventually go away, you need to talk to somebody. If these changes happen and they last for weeks or months, you need to talk to somebody. Don't be ashamed. Hyper alert to environment. That's another thing I experienced in Walmart. I felt like my eyes were this big. And the best I could figure, I was scanning for threats. It wasn't a conscious thing, but I was just hyper alert. Uh, I'm pretty alert situationally, situational awareness, you know, from my law enforcement days, but it was hyper drive. I was, you know, it was almost like I could hear conversations way over there, you know. Uh, it was weird. It was weird. But it was, it was weird, but it was normal. Social changes. You may experience withdrawal. You may also suddenly become more social or something. You, know, you just never know. Uh, you may be angry at everybody. You may get angry at God. You may start questioning God. You may question His authority, questioning your own religious or spiritual status, increase or decrease in religious activity. Family changes. You may get a little snappy. Did I get snappy? I don't think I got snappy. I didn't get really snappy. Um, but it's probably because I was on guard against it, knowing that I could, you know, because I knew this stuff. Um, let's see. Others' reactions to you. People may second guess your reactions. They may judgmental statements. Boy, I got hammered on uh, on social media. I put the story out immediately because I'm kind of a trainer at heart. I wanted to make sure that people were aware of what happened to me, to hopefully not happen to them. And the vast majority of people that responded were kind and compassionate and appreciative that I was willing to put myself out there, mistakes and all, because I admitted to all the mistakes that I could think of. But there was a tiny fraction of people that were just virulent. I mean, just venomous. Venomous, you know? And so be, be aware that people are going to second guess you and judge how you responded and things like that. Just be aware of it. Um, yeah, some people may be afraid to be around you because they don't know what to say. So, after a critical incident, what now? Well, the next slide will be what's now. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> In theory, anyway. Handling critical incident stress. See that at the bottom? Does this look familiar? Regular exercise. Regular honest communication with your spouse, parents, peers, uh, your pastor. Healthy eating, plenty of water, healthy amount of sleep and rest. That's the exact same slide as, uh, as we looked at for handling uh, cumulative stress. But it's, it's even more important following a critical incident. Some specific helpful ideas. Strenuous exercise within 48 hours, if you're able. I was not allowed within 48 hours. He didn't want me doing that. But as soon as I could, we Patty had me out walking, you know. Even before that, she would tell me, get up and walk around the house, you know, because good things happen when you when you get your blood going. Structure time, structure your time. Uh, talk to others you trust. Man, I can't I can't talk to say that strong enough. Talk. Talk, 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 talk. Tell your story. That's cathartic. It's called catharsis. And the more you tell it, the more your brain can process it. 
It will be different every time you tell it because pieces will fall into place. Um, your memory will be correcting itself. But talk. Don't zip it. Talk. Um, don't keep secrets. I'll tell you about that in just a minute. We are back in the void. <laughs> Make sure I didn't skip one. Yep, I didn't. Yay. Also consider, should you watch the news? It, uh, the, you know, depending on what kind of it, uh, crisis you live through, um, if it's covered by the media, should you watch it? You know, I can't answer that for you. Uh, but you can seek counsel from those who know you well. Now keep a notepad with you to log down events as your memory uh, recur or comes back. Tips for family members and significant others. If, they, if you have a loved one who's involved in a critical incident, these are tips for you. Listen to them carefully. Spend time with them. Offer your listening ear even if not asked. Help with everyday tasks. Give them some private time. Don't push them to talk. Don't take their anger personally. They may get snappy. They may get a little snippy. Don't take it personally. Tell them you're sorry the event had to occur and you want to help. And tell them you're glad that they're okay. That's not on there, but that's important. The best way to help is to encourage communication, exercise, proper eating, and rest. And I hit that twice, but it didn't go twice. Return, these are helpful coping tips. Return to, your, to the balance of life uh, for support. Talk to your spouse, your pastor, your close friends. Remember, you have permission to feel. You don't have to keep those, feel, those floating balls pushed underwater. Uh, let, your, let yourself feel those emotions. Don't try to swallow them. That does more harm than good. Exercise. This helps your body chemically. Just like shooting, shooting a base, baseball, and most everything else, there are basics you must return to. Uh, use the incident to grow, get better as a person, and to help others who are in need. What you can expect long term. Preoccupation with the event. Everybody's opinion. Lawsuits, maybe, depending on the nature of the event that you're involved in. Bad press coverage, again. Uh, special interest groups, meetings, rallies. Mark of Cain, again, everybody's looking at me. These are all, these are all, it's normal for these things to happen. Stupid statements, mostly intended as jokes. Uh, gosh, I had, I've got some examples of those, but I, I forgot this was on that slide. I can't remember what they were, you know, but uh, people who said really stupid things to me. But they didn't mean it, you know, they were just trying to break the ice and, you know, I, I don't remember. But, uh, but just know to expect that. And then eventually, hopefully, a return to normalcy. Uh, main things to remember. Everybody reacts differently. Don't judge folks based on how you think they should react. That should also say, don't judge folks on how you think you would react. Because you don't know. Until it happens, you don't know. Any reaction, including no reaction, is a normal reaction. And finally, if you've been involved in a critical incident, whether you experience no symptoms, moderate symptoms, or severe symptoms, you are a normal person having a normal reaction to an abnormal event. Here's the website. It actually takes you to alderfarms.net slash trauma strikes, but I, I spent money without asking Patty and bought the domain trauma strikes.org because it's easy and it sounds good. Trauma strikes.org, and there's actually already a video of the presentation I did last year, so you can actually rewatch the presentation, not today's, but the one we did last year. It's there. It's not monetized. I don't want any money for it. Um, and you can download a free PDF. I want you to download that, and I want you to keep it handy, not only for yourself, but everybody, raise your hand if you know somebody within the last year who has been involved in some type of traumatic event. Look at that. I want you to email them this PDF, okay? Just email it to them. I don't want nothing from it. I'm not asking for, I don't want a nickel from them. I want people to get this information in their hands. So I can, and then it'd be cool if people email me all during the year and say, hey man, let me tell you the story about how the information you shared helped save somebody's life or helped whatever. 
I want to get testimonies like that young lady who came weeping last year after this presentation and saying, you set me free from years of thinking there was something wrong with me. So get it and share it. Keep it for yourself and also share it. Feel free to print it out. I don't remember how many pages it is. It's not like 100 pages, but it may be like 17. I don't know. Uh, but it's not, it's like, it's got bullets on it, you know, so it's not like 17 pages of eight point type. You know, it's not that. Uh, so anyway, I think that's it. Any questions? Yes. Yes. Yeah, and I meant to. Thank you. I meant to come back. Pat like said, I got a few minutes before my before it's up to share the importance of not keeping. So um, the. Uh, I told you my son shot, he shot the dog. Uh, let me give you this little encouragement to parents. My son, I was near, I was near despair, thinking nobody was going to come to, nobody could hear me screaming for help. And I'm glad I didn't get to despair, because if I had got there, I probably would have just let go of the collar and said, get it over. You know, that's what happens. When people get despair. Anyway, I was almost there, I looked up, I see Corey coming. And I can see he had my block, mine or his block in his hand, and I'm like, yes. He got about 15 feet away, and I said, shoot him now. And he shot him either. So the encouragement to parents is, uh, I had trained my children when I was still in law enforcement, and they were little bitty things. And if we were ever out eating at McDonald's, because I was a cop, and that's about all we could afford to go out and eat at McDonald's. If we're out eating at McDonald's, and Daddy says, get under the table. Don't ask questions. Get under the table. And I said that mainly for my youngest daughter, who would have been the one to say, get under the table, why? Yeah. <laughs> Corey, who was 19 at the time, remembered, oh, oh, what I told him was, I said, get under the table. I said, in a crisis situation, you, you obey daddy immediately and without question. My 19-year-old son remembered that, and he shot immediately. And uh, so anyway, uh, we, uh, like I said, I didn't, we didn't know that he had shot in my pants leg until we found the bullet hole and figured it all out. And I don't want to take up too much time about how that happened. But we, I, I, I got some counsel from a law enforcement friend of mine that at the time sounded like good counsel. And he said, I wouldn't tell him if I were you because it may cause him to hesitate if there's ever a next time. And that sounded like good advice. And so I took it. We decided not to tell him. We decided not to tell him. And uh, so then... The guy who's in charge of the Mississippi State Critical Innocent Training uh, debriefing team wanted, he heard about my story uh, through a mutual friend and he wanted to have lunch with me. And on the way up there, and this was like in February, early February, I think. So the attack was December 9th, this was in February. I'm driving down the road and suddenly I see the dog's face. <laughs> I had to do like that. I didn't run off the road, it was momentary, it was gone. I told him about it at lunch. And he kind of went, huh. He said, you, sh you shouldn't still be having flashbacks this far after. And he asked me this question. He said, uh, what, what have you not told anybody? What secret are you keeping? And I'm like, what are you talking about? And he explained to me that science shows, that research shows that, um, that withholding information like that can be directly tied to flashbacks. I said, you've got to be kidding me. And he told me a story about an officer in Texas, I think, who had been on a a uh, uh, tactical team and he held you know the big shields the big black police shields and they got this clear bulletproof glass window so they can see through it as they advance so they were in some kind of big bad situation and that guy was holding that shield and he could see bullets hitting that place but you know pretty traumatic right well five, he survived it and following the event sometime later he said uh, Tim Tim said I got a call from this guy he said, man, I need some help. I'm in a ditch. And he said, what do you mean? He thought he was speaking metaphorically. He said, what do you mean? He said, I mean, I'm in a ditch. I'm, I, I, my, my car is in a ditch. He said, well, he's thinking, why are you calling me, right? But he said, well, what happened? He said, I'm driving down the road, and I see like a 300-pound bullet coming at the windshield of my car, and I swerved to miss it and ran into a ditch. And Tim said, he, you know, he began asking the guy, well, he started talking about this thing. He said, what are you holding back? What have you not told anybody? And the guy was like, no, nothing. I haven't held anything back. And Tim kept pressing his guy, no, no, no. This went on for a few minutes. And the guy finally went, oh, there is something. And 
the guy's flashbacks on the way. Tim didn't tell me what the guy, what, I'm like, what, what was it? You know, uh, yeah, we still he, he, know. He, he, I want to know. Yeah, I want to know what it was. But, <laughs> so anyway, he tells me the story, and then he looks at me, and he says, so, Tommy, what are you holding back? What have you not told anybody? What's your secret? And I'm the same as that officer. No, nothing. I'm, I haven't held anything back. I've been, I've been willing to talk about it. And he said, he kept pressing me. He kept pressing me. And after a couple of minutes of this, I said, I said, no, I said, I, I, you know, Patty and I have talked about everything. And when I said her name, or no, I said, I've told Patty every part of this. And when I said her name, it dawned on me, and I said, <gasps> but I hadn't told Corey. And it was that I had withheld from Corey that he had shot in my pants leg. And Tim says, you need to tell him. Because he said, he's going to find out. And if you with if, if he finds out and you don't tell him, then he's going to wonder what else Dad has held back from me. So I, I made the determination sitting right at that lunch table. Absolutely, I'm going to tell Corey. And from the moment I made the decision that I was going to tell Corey, I haven't had a flashback since. From so from that moment, now that ain't magic. It ain't spiritual. I can't explain it, but it, it happened. Now, here's the punchline of the story. It's either that day or that, whatever it was. It's the following Sunday. <coughs> the following Sunday. I said, Corey, come in here and he, talk to you about something. I had my, my pants behind my back or something, my blue jeans, somewhere close. And he sits down on the couch and I started telling him, I don't remember how I led up into it, but at some point, before I came out with it, he starts grinning. I said, what are you smiling about? Do you know what I'm about to tell you? He said, yeah, I shot Peter Pansley. I'm like, how do you know that? And whose phone was it? Patty, had let, I, Patty and I had been texting about it. And Patty had left her phone open. Of course, not a snooper. But her phone was open. I think he must be. <laughs> Maybe he is. Maybe he is. Maybe he's holding that y'all know Patty's bad. Patty's a stalker. <laughs> but her phone was on the bar in the house and you know, open to the text message. And he and he had read it. So he knew already, you know. And uh, so anyway, but from the moment I had a flashback since, you know, from the moment. So don't keep secrets. Uh, talk it through. And All right. Now time is up, but let's say that and Corey is a no reaction person. Yeah, Corey had no reaction. You would think, you know, uh, oh, I didn't want to say this, that in the milliseconds between me saying shooting now and him pulling that trigger, he thought to himself, I'm about to, this is a 19-year-old kid with no military, no nothing. I'm about to shoot my own father in the leg, but that's not going to kill him and his dog will. <laughs> sure enough. So, anyway, yes, ma'am. Um, I made mistakes. I would point you to aldermanfarms.net slash blog for time's sake. Because if I get started talking about the attack, we will be here in March. <laughs> I, I made mistakes that precipitated the attack, but the dog had some bad wiring that made him not stop. Did you say uh, the city of the Absolutely. Listen to me. Any event that meets the criteria I don't care what it is, you know, and absolutely a horrible medical diagnosis, you bet. Nobody's here right right after this, so I saw some hands go up, but you want to answer some questions? Yeah, I'm, you know, until we get run out, I'm happy to answer questions if you've got. I see one way in the back. Yeah, I wanted to know if uh, there's anything different or anything additional if, like, uh, I've got a I would think, um, depending on the level of difficulty that they're having years later, they, they may need to speak to someone professionally. But I've got a lot of faith in this information right here, helping people, because I'm going to tell you something. What, what causes people more problems is not the symptoms themselves, but the lack of knowledge that it's normal to, to have it. And so what haunts people, just like that young lady last year, was not, see what had happened was she didn't have any 
She went into almost like shock. She wasn't weeping when her, her husband died. She was tearless. But she was devastated. She was broken hearted. And, some, and somebody thought she should have been crying. They, you know. And so it wasn't the lack of tears that caused her problems for years. It was that somebody planted in her head that that was not normal. When it's perfectly normal. I'm not, I don't cry as much. You know? Um, so I will get this PDF, get it to them, and then say, see if, this, you know, see if anything in here helps you. And if not, just encourage them to talk to somebody. Uh, there's no shame in asking, in asking for help. You're welcome. Any more questions? Well, I I encourage everybody to become golf behavior experts. Uh, what we know now, when we bought it, we got it in nine weeks. Great presentation. And we got him home from Tennessee, from hours away from my house. Um, he he was was it over food, Patty? What was the when he was nine weeks old? Was that over food? Yeah, it was because he was going to chew up a corn. Oh, he was going to chew up a corn, and Patty busted him. And we didn't know. She rolled him over, you know, busted him, whatever. And he never stopped growling. Not viciously, but he never really, you know, he never. What I know now, we should have picked that little puppy up, got back in our car, drove for nine hours back to Tennessee and said, nope. Because that was the first sign that now we told him that he was the boss. And he kept it in check for most, you know, during the course of his year and a half, he flashed aggression a couple of times, three, maybe three or four times in a year and a half. Never bit, but he flashed aggression and then would apologize. You know what I mean by that? Doesn't. This is me, sir, look me in my eyes. That dog needs to go. Because this is not a brief fashion. I think they're a fabulous group. Not when, not when they are present. They are designed, they are God wired them to be very autonomous. And, and you're at a critical time in his age where he's becoming an adult. And if he is flash progression at all, so look at him, he's got to go. I don't mean necessarily put him down, but my first option would be to find somebody reach out to uh, go to the uh, livestock guardian groups on Facebook and say, I'm looking for somebody who's interested in that. Uh, you know, you know, kind of leaves and all that. I mean, I, I'll plead. I'll, and again, I, I'll plead. I'm not bashing the dream. I'm going to have to make my dog. But, yeah. but they are not pets. They are pets.
Y'all been on you. Y'all been on. Yeah, y'all been on live. Oh no, you're kidding. <laughs> no, it doesn't matter. We We're just told our our secrets. Uh oh. Huh. You don't tell me to erase it. But but the only people that's been watching. All right, y'all. I'm sorry I couldn't text back to y'all if y'all had any questions or comments or anything. But um. Anyway, I'm gonna try and end the video. Do I just push X?